All right. Mm hmm. Ready? And I am drinking coffee out of a glass. Yeah. Oh, it's, oh, it does look like. I probably shouldn't. This Maybe. is coffee. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pursuit. Jeff Hutchin here with John Sporov, and as you can tell, I have my orange on in preparation for October. Well, I'm, okay, I have black okay. on the bottom here. I'm, I'm black glad going. you saved that, because I was just about to say, it really looks like you and I are in different seasons of life, like physically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm ready for winter. You're, you're going to Mexico or something. I, didn't, uh, I did not look at my, app on my, my weather app on my phone before I walked out of the house today, realizing it was going to be as chilly as it was, but hey, it's good. It feels good. 46 and, degrees uh, in Colorado today. No, we're right? headed into some new seasons, which, yeah. you know, that's originally where we were going to go with today's episode. We were going to talk a little bit about seasons and how they change and how seasons, in order from to move from one to the next, death is required. And, and we've touched on that before. We have. We may, we may, we reserve the right to remind people about it because it, it, it's like any truth. It just sort of unfolds. But speaking of seasons, sometimes people uh, are in different seasons of life. There's a transition that, that happens in, in many of those those seasons which involve a house that's right and when you're in a transition through your season what better thing uh to do than to call the the folks over at premier home loans God, that was smooth wasn't it it's pretty good you see you how i just did that off guard right segue there. you didn't that know was, where i was we, going we didn't even prepare that didn't. that was like wow now I'm midstream in the, in the commercial. I just totally here. screwed up your and commercial. You, sure did. you screwed up my commercial. Bottom line is the folks over at Premier Home Loans are the group you need to turn to for one of those biggest decisions you're going to make and, and sure. how you're going to fund this baby, right? Yep. How are you going to pay for it? Yeah. And uh, with the changing times, you need somebody that's on top of it, that has mm -hmm. your interests in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a family-based, um, faith-based organization. Yep. And Dana Hall and her group just doing it exceptional job we're, we're talking to them right now on some things that they're doing for us and uh imagine though if you if you sold your house and you have a bunch of equity in that house and you, you decide you know what the kids moved out we're going to downsize yeah. or whatever um and now you got all this equity is the, is it best to go get a 15 year right and pay, pay a little bit more down or or is it you know do you, do you stick in with it the, these are questions that dana would love to help i mean seriously with. we are literally working through a transaction right now and she's coming up with some really um, I would say just just very creative approaches on things. That, creative that, and legal, hopefully. I hope they're legal. <laughs> That's on her. Well, ultimately it's on me. But you're signing. Uh, hopefully the they're legal. But no, she's come up with some really creative solutions for us. That it gives us options. That's the point. That you know, we get point. to choose ultimately what's best for us. Yeah. But if you are looking to make that big decision, we have a group that you need to reach out to, and you can find them at Premier Home Loans Co. dot com on. The, the World, World Wide, Wide Web. Web, otherwise known as WWW. Don't forget the WWs That's right. in the You'll beginning. Be, you never know what those things you do. Never you know. On there. You never know what could happen. Well, man, we're going to blow up. You know what? I'm actually very, very excited about our conversation today, and, and I know you are too, because it involves one of, one of our, I would say, joint favorite stories, and at least it is for yeah. me in, in all of Scripture. It's a very obscure story. It's, it's a story that rarely is talked about, I'll be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, but it has deep, deep meaning that we're going to hopefully unpack and unfold for you guys here today um, that can give us some deep insight, not only to the heart of God and what he thinks about us, but also uh, just, just the prophecy that unfolds through the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to talk a little bit about that. But, but as we step into this story, it takes a little bit of a setup. That I want to make sure that, that we spend some time talking about. Where we're going to be focusing, if you have your Bibles uh, with you and you want to kind of follow along with us, we're going to be dialing in specifically to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And uh, what we're, what the, the time frame that we find ourselves in here is, is that David has just become king. He's become king over Israel. And um, he, is, um, he is just settling into his kingship. There was there was quite a uh, you know a long road into his kingship. You know he found out at a very young age yep. through the prophet Samuel that he would become the next king. Mm -hmm. But there was a king already in place. It was King Saul, mm -hmm. and there was quite some time between when David heard he was going to be king uh, until he actually became king. Right. And that transition time proved to be very challenging and very difficult. Um, as Saul discovered the anointing that was upon David. It was it was clear now 
that the kingship wasn't going to be passed down through Saul's bloodline mm-hmm. to his son Jonathan, but instead was moving out of his bloodline into this young man named David, who was also a fantastic and powerful warrior for King Saul. Mm-hmm. And so we see jealousy begin to unfold. But as, as that, that saga unfolds, which is fascinating all throughout First and Second Samuel, you can read through that, is a, a deep relationship is formed between David and, ironically, who should have been Correct. the next king, who was Jonathan. Right. And, and we see this friendship form. It, it even formed after the prophecy, but before he became king. Yeah. They made covenant together. Before that, you bet. To the point of, if I remember right, Jonathan said, "Listen, your enemies are my enemies. Yeah. Like you're, I'm with you in this, and and it's a well. We're, I'm probably jumping ahead. No, because we're going to probably start talking about covenant versus promise. Yeah, no, it's versus, it's, but it's a, it's a remarkable friendship, and it, and it shows remarkable humility on Jonathan's but, behalf. Yeah, um, to be able to be submissive to the future king, David." And Jonathan probably had aspirations. I would have to. I would have to guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is now submitting to David, knowing that God has chosen David to be the next king. And you said they stepped into a covenant relationship. And you spoke a little bit about that covenant. Yeah. But there was a there was a very significant portion of that covenant that was spoken between the two of them. And basically, the the part of that covenant I want to talk about here today is when David says to Jonathan that your household will forever be blessed. In other words. When I become king, yep, I will take care of you. I'm not forgetting. I will not forget anyone mm-hmm. from your household. They will always be a part of me as long as I'm king. And that was a significant part of this covenant. And Jonathan was, was covenanting his, his, um, his commitment to him and his willingness to follow and, and all the things that you talked about. And so with this covenant in place, we see a series of events unfold as Saul is attempting to kill David, right? fascinating stories the first you know there's multiple attempts but one of the the big attempts is when uh david and his men are hiding in the cave Mm -hmm. right and saul and his army are pursuing david and and saul needs to relieve himself if i could use that term that's probably the safest term for this family show yeah i thought he was sleeping though in there no not that time oh okay well david was saul goes into the the cave to relieve himself yeah and he takes off his robe Sets it on the ground in order to go to the bathroom, and and you remember what David's servant said to David. Basically, why don't you kill him? Here, See, here was your opportunity. God's delivered you. Yeah, he de- delivered him into your hands. Right now's your chance. Slit his throat. Right, kill him. Right. And do you remember what David said? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Uh, yeah, he said. So, he basically, said, "No, I'm staying undercover." Is is what he said. He said. He, he said, said, "I'm staying submitted." That's right. I'm staying undercover, and not only that, but who am I to kill the Lord's anointed? That's it. God has anointed King Saul mm-hmm. for this season to be king. Speaking of seasons, David knew his season was not yet; it was to mm-hmm. come, wasn't yet. And he said, "Who am I to kill God's anointed unless God tells me to?" And he hasn't. So therefore, he cuts off a piece of the robe. Right. Saul puts the robe back on, goes on his way, and from a distance, David cries out to him and says. Hey, hey, look at this. I could have killed you. Yeah. And I chose not to. So what would you say then to somebody out there? Because we could camp right there yeah. just for a second and say, you know, something that somebody has been praying for. Um, and the, the answer to that thing is seemingly is at their door, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's a financial issue, whatever. But to, to get it, you've got to get it in the wrong way. To say, wow, this is a miracle that this showed up here, and I've got the opportunity to seize the thing that God has promised to me, and to have the discernment that says, no, but I'm, but I've got to be honorable in the way that I do this, and I've got to stay submitted to the Lord. Mm-hmm. To say, nope, it's it, it's going to happen, but not like this. Mm-hmm. And you use the word that it requires, and that is discernment. Mm-hmm. And what is shown in that example right there is, to your point, all the circumstances point to a certain thing. Right. And the problem is, if we use that solely as our guide, yep. oftentimes we're going to make the wrong choice. For sure. Instead, David had the, the ability to have that discernment, right? That he said, no, this is not the season. This is not the time. God yep. has not released me to do this. So that's one big event. Saul continues to pursue him, even though David had a chance to kill him. Mm-hmm. And that's the second example. And that's when David and his servant, again, come upon Saul's camp. And all, all his men are sleeping. Remember that? And mm-hmm. Saul's right in the middle. And by the way, his main bodyguard is laying next to him, asleep. 
and David sees the spear of David right next to, or excuse me, the spear of Saul right next to Saul's head and his water jug. And what, you remember what his servant said to David this time? No, I don't remember. He goes, hey, just say the word. Mm. I'll sneak in there mm -hmm. and I will pin Saul to the ground mm -hmm. with his own spear. Mm -hmm. Like meaning, last time I told you to do it and you didn't. I'll this time, it. all you got to do is just say the word. I'll do it. I'd be happy do to it. do it, right? Right. And David basically says the same thing. No, who am I to take the Lord's anointed? And so he instead sneaks in, takes the spear, takes the water jug, same kind of approach, sneaks out of the camp, and from a distance yells out and says, I could have killed you. Here's your spear. Here's right. your water jug, and I chose not to. So do you think in that, in, when he was saying that, and the reason that he took that, was it to, A, make a point that I could have killed you, or, B, to make the point that I honored you? Or both. is it both? I think it's both. I think it's both. To say, hey, you think I hate you. You think I uh -huh. want you dead, but I really don't. I don't know what's got into your mind, King Saul, to think that I want you dead. It's it's not my fault that God you know, mm -hmm. put his hand on me and said, you're going to be the next king. Yep. But for this season, you're still king, and I honor that, and I'm still going to serve you. But Saul couldn't live with that in his jealousy and, and you know the things that he was dealing with. Okay. Mm. So we move forward. Again, with the backdrop of this covenant relationship between Jonathan and David. That is, I'm always going to take care of your household. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the backdrop of the story. Well, as things begin to unfold, and as Saul's disobedience to God continues, Saul's life ends up getting taken on the battlefield. Matter of fact, it says that as the Philistines are closing in on him, he chooses to lay on his own sword. So Saul takes his own life. It, um, and he did that. Oh, man, this is I'm just going to get it out because God's downloading it to me right now. But it, it says in Scripture that the reason that, that, that the, the straw that was finally, that finally proverbially broke the camel's back in regard to his life and his kingship was that he went, not to go too far into this, but he went out and Samuel was the, the prophet, I believe, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, and Samuel told him, hey, go out. He said, should I go to battle? Should I, and, and as the king and the priest often did, right? And and the priest said, yes, you should, but go out there and wait for me, and I'll go do the the sacrifice. And after I do that, then you'll go in and, and you'll be victorious. And he waited a week, and so Saul began to get impatient. And finally, he just took, he, he said, you know what, he's not coming. He already told me we're going to be victorious. Give me the, the calf, and I'll just mm -hmm. do the offering. Mm -hmm. And, and he did that, and Samuel shows up and mm -hmm. catches him in the act. And he says this, and God spoke to Samuel to say to Saul, because you've done this thing, your kingdom has been stripped from you. That's right. And here's what just got downloaded to me, and, and it's this. He, Saul's nature was a king and a conqueror. And, and out of that nature and out of that gifting, quite frankly, there's some stuff that goes along with it. Those people are generally ruthless. Mm -hmm. And and the things that he did dishonorable to David aren't the things that God said, okay, now you're no, we're done. It's when he stepped outside of his purpose, outside of who God called him called him to be, and operated in that that God said, Yeah, okay, now we're done. Because it's not about at that point behavior, it's about identity. And by the way, that's 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 true um, for all of us. That and that's why the, this call to sonship is so critical that you and I are listening and we're discerning, and we're walking in God's favor, because the moment we step out of that, now now we're kind of outside the protection. Not that God can't extend beyond that, but that's right. where we become exposed. I mean, you say it that way. And so it's why it's so critical. We have to stay dialed in to what it is, what it is God's calling us to. Just just before we go on, yep. I, I feel like this is the type of show i got to do this. i got to put my head hat backwards because we're probably about to get into this some This is stuff. about to dig into some cool stuff. Here. All right. Okay. Hat is now backwards for those listening. I love it. Okay. So now as what happens on the bed, here, something interesting happens in Saul's death, by the way. So he, he asks his armor bearer. He says, hey, mm. I want you to kill me. Mm -hmm. Clearly the enemies are coming upon us. I don't want them to have you know the... the um, the, the satisfaction the satisfaction of killing yeah. you so i want you to kill me and the armor bearer says i ain't doing it and so saul goes fine and he lays on his own sword okay yep. so and, and many of his sons die yep. in this battle jonathan included yeah and so now we fast forward david has a messenger come to him and says david saul's dead jonathan's dead yeah and david goes how do you know and he said, well, because I came upon Saul on the battlefield. And he was still alive while he was laying on his sword. Mm. 
And the king said to me, please put me out of my misery, basically. I'm, I'm clearly dying. Would you please take my life because I'm suffering here on the battlefield? And the guy said, so I went ahead and cut his throat. And so King David, that's how I know that King Saul's dead. Yeah. You remember what Saul did to the messenger? You mean David. I mean, what David did to the messenger? Same thing, I believe. For you to kill God's anointing. Exactly. (laughs) Like even dying, you're not allowed to kill that man. And so he ends up killing the messenger. What uh, what a message on honor. Yeah. And what a message on honor. It really is. It really is. And so anyway, so we fast forward, and David is now fully king. And he has he has the territories, and he's continuing to to succeed. And but what happens is some crazy things. Is some of David's leaders take it upon themselves to kill some of the remaining sons that Saul had that was still alive. Mm-hmm. One of them was a gentleman by the name of Ishbosheth, and and one of David's like I said, one of David's right hand men went into Ishbosheth's bedroom. This is when peace was in place, right? Ishbosheth was serving David, even though he was the son of Saul. And this servant went in and kills Ishbosheth on his own on his own bed, thinking he's done a great thing. And he comes back to David and says, Guess what I did for you? He said, What'd you do? I killed Ishbosheth. You did what? Yeah, I killed Ishbosheth. That's Saul's son. You want that, right? You'd think that these people would You'd learn. They'd figure it out. David kills him. As no. Well, by the way. No. And so why? What, what, what's going on here? What David is going back to is this covenant that we talked about at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. That, that even though right now your father Saul considers me his enemy and he wants me dead, I've made a covenant with you and with your father, even though your father doesn't even know it, mm-hmm. that I'm going to protect your household when I become king. So implied in that, and by illustration, what you just pointed out, oh, this is so, this is so meaningful. Covenant does not end with death of the one that's promised no. to. And thank God, because we're living in the new covenant, and there was one that died. And we know that God the Father still extends that covenant and, to us. And here's the deal. We're, we're not just living in the new covenant, John. We're living in Abrahamic covenant. We're living in the all Noah covenant. We're living in the Davidic up. covenant. Mm. We're living in all these covenants right now. These, these covenants that were extended throughout the Old Testament, even though these men didn't fulfill in, in 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 total completion, all the things for which God covenanted to them, yeah, that it still extends to us, yeah, okay, as followers, as because Scripture says, if we are in Christ, we are seeds of Abraham. Guess mm-hmm. what? That means the covenant applies to us as well. So, David is so hardcore on these things and keeping these these men alive and killing the ones that kill him. Why? Because the covenant is being broken, and David yeah. sees it. Yeah. So David does what most of us would do and he says is there anyone else from the line of saul from the line of jonathan i'm going to push back i don't know that any the most of the rest of us would have done that because and and here's why i say that this is a i'm not going to say it's a burden for david but this is something that he has to keep in the back of his mind that that's going to guide him that's going to set parameters for what he does and doesn't do for the rest of his life so in some regards if he thought that that was the last guy there would be some relief that says well god you know i honored these and, and killed the ones who killed them right <sighs> i'm done yeah but he doesn't to your point he says is there anybody he wants to make sure is there anybody that remains of the house of, of saul F- fair enough and and your your assessment i think is is probably very accurate so so david let me restate it then. David goes the extra mile. Mm-hmm. And he says, is there anyone else? I, I think everyone's Amazing. dead. But is there anyone else? And they said, actually, King, there is. There's one. And his name's Ishbosheth. And the story of Ishbosheth. Oh, excuse me. Ishbosheth. Yeah. You're getting the chefs mixed Sorry, the up. Chef. The, the Mephibosheth. Ish came first. The meth, meth right. came Me- second. Meth came yeah. later. So Mephibosheth, he said, he, he's remaining. In the story of Mephibosheth, we see in various different places in Second yeah. Samuel. Yeah. It starts off by learning a little bit about this young boy, that in the haste of the attack of the Philistines, uh, this young boy was taken by the maidservant, and was, they were taking him to hide him. Mm-hmm. And in that haste of running away, she dropped him. And when she dropped him, he became handicapped, basically paralyzed, and he wasn't able to use his feet anymore. Mm-hmm. He lame in his feet is what Scripture says. That's right. And so they say, yes, King, Mephibosheth still remains. He is Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. And uh, he, is, he is staying in this village. He's still alive. This, and the village, just to point out, is called Lodabar. And the meaning of Lodabar 
Do you know? Oh, you know this. You told me, but I can't remember. Okay, Lodabar means basically the place of forgottenness. Oh. It's the place of. It's a desert. Come on. It's a desert, and so and so implied in that, not just that. Oh, it's cool that we know the definition of that, but implied in that means. This was the disgrace of the family. Yes. This is the lowest rung on the Saul family ladder, so much so that they said, you know what, let's put him out in the place where people forget. Which, by the way, it just now hit me. David could relate to that. Whew. Yeah. He was the forgotten of the sons. Wow. Think about that. <sighs> Remember when Samuel came to check out all the sons? And David wasn't even there. And and Samuel goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's mm. none of these guys you haven't. There's got to be mm. another one. He goes, well, yeah, there's another hey, one. He's way out there. In the, he's out in the field. We, yeah. we don't really he's recognize him. He's out in Lodabar. Him. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I told you this is going to be a hat turner backer. Okay. If I had one on, I'd turn it with you. So right. it says it says the son, this this son, Mephibosheth, he is, he is in the place that's been forgotten. Yeah. And he says, well, I want you to go to this place that's been forgotten. I want you to bring him to me. Mm-hmm. And this is what happens. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up the story here. In um, there's one that... verse six. We're in Second Samuel nine. I'm going to go verse six. Okay. So it says, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. Mm-hmm. And David said, Mephibosheth, your servant. He replied, Do not be afraid. David said to him, For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. It says, mm-hmm. it says, now Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice, a dead dog like me? And he says, then the king sum- summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring him the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. And so we read this story and we go, you know what? That was a really nice thing. Mm. David did a really nice thing here. He reached out and he fulfilled his end of the covenant, which is, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing of integrity of honor that David does here by bringing this boy back in. But the meaning of the story is so much deeper. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm going to share just the first part of it. And I know, I know you have some insight on this story, too, that I want sure. you to share. Yeah, for sure. But, but the thing I want, you, want us to remember is this. Um, these stories are not put in here by chance. Mm-hmm. This is just not a historical um, story referencing uh, a part of King David's kingship and to show what a good man that he was. It, it has prophetic meaning. It's, it's, um, it's a reflection of something that is to come. So I want you to think about it. One of the promises in the Davidic covenant to David was that the Messiah would come through his bloodline. So in this story, I want you to replace David Mm -hmm. with Jesus. And you and I are Mephibosheth. No doubt. And what Christ did when he came is he said, I'm going after those people. I'm going after the Mephibosheths that are in the land of the forgotten. That's crazy. I know. I know. I know. It just I it, mean, it hits it, you. It, I, know. It, <laughs> I know. It wrecks me, man, because um, we are Mephibosheth. Mm-hmm. And without, without Christ, we're forgotten. And so when David reaches out and, and gets Mephibosheth and he pulls him into his household, it represents so much. Because what's actually happening here? He's adopting Mephibosheth. Mm-hmm. Mephibosheth is now his son. That's right. And he says, because no one's invited to the king's table except the king's family. Mm-hmm. And so there's so much that's meant by the king's table, right? Because what that really represents and what that symbolizes is provision and favor and blessing and acceptance and, and adoption and, and all those wonderful things. Authority. That, that, and authority. And, and, that's, yeah. and that's the other part of it. Because when David, because he could have just stopped there and said, you know what, I'm going to take care of you. You're We're going to feed you. We're going to feed you. You're going to eat good the rest and of your life. And the would have been that's right. more than happy. Sure. But he says, not only that, I'm going to restore back to you the land for which your father, your grandfather Saul had. Mm. 
and we and we got to. It's important we talk about what the land means because you touched on it. Ooh. From Genesis to Revelation, the story of the Bible is about mankind losing relationship, dominion, and authority from God in mm. the very beginning. Mm. Adam and Eve lost it. From that point forward, all the way up until the very end when we're reunited with the Father, the story is about God reestablishing relationship, intimacy, dominion, and authority to his most favored creation. Mm. And that's you and I. Mm -hmm. And what we see symbolically represented here in this story is David is saying, I'm giving back to you, Mephibosheth, your identity. I'm giving back Mm. to you your purpose. I'm giving back to you dominion and authority. And you are now a child of the king. I'll even... uh, what hit me here as you were saying that, and I, I appreciate us diving, diving into this. I mean, it's amazing every time we open up Scripture that just God just speaks. But even more specifically than you're right, than just saying, hey, we're going to take care of you. He gave him land. What If, if I were to ask you to, to define what a king is, what would you say? He is a... Um he has dominion and authority over a territory. He restored kingship to the family yeah. of Saul. Yeah. yeah. He said, you know what? You're going to be a king under a king. Yeah. That's exactly and what are right. we? Kings and priests. Yeah. Joshua 1.3 says, uh, hey, guys, when you go into the promised land, every place, every piece of ground you set your feet on, that ground is yours to take. That's like, right. go put your feet, every place you put it. And so this is Man, I mean, it's just occurring to me. You're right. It's, there's graciousness involved. There's provision involved and all of that. But he's he's making him an under king, if I could say yeah. it like that. And in the last line in, in chapter 9 says this, and it kind of restates, you know, that yeah. he eats there and so forth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in, in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he, he still was, had weakness. That's he right. was still lame. So I want you to share with our with sure. our listeners the other part of this observation oh, you shared with me that just it rocked my world. Yeah, it rocked me when it showed up at a time kind of like this. I was sharing in a Bible study, but um, what I realized is I'm is I'm picturing this is I'm picturing Mephibosheth being helped in because you know he can't walk. Maybe he's in a you know if they have wheelchairs back yeah. then I don't know what, but he's being assisted into this place and saying I am but a dead dog. Like, don't you see me? I'm the disgrace of my family. I've been told this since I was little. That's why I was been in Lodabar. And he said, no, no, okay, forget all that. You're being, um, we're going to take care of you. I'm going to give you land. You will always eat at my table. And what I, what I realized is I then saw him being assisted to the table. And, and you might imagine what King David's table must have looked like, ornate and the, just draped with an incredible tablecloth and, and all the fancy uh, uh, you know, uh, setting the table setting must have been incredible with gold and all the stuff. And there sits Mephibosheth. And what I realized as I was looking at him in the, in my mind's eye is I realized he just covered his weakness. <laughs> Cause you know what? You and I could be sitting here as we are right now and you could be lame or I could be lame in my feet and they have no idea because the table, because the position it. that I'm in, yeah. Cover so it says God. The the scripture says it's the glory of God to cover a matter, and He took him and He said, "Yeah." And by the way, not only I'm giving you this land, I'm making sure you're 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 provided for. I'm giving you authority, and I'm also covering your weakness. (laughs) As long as we remain at the King's table, our weaknesses are covered, man. There's uh, there's so much truth and so much depth in this story, and hopefully, you know, I hope and pray that we did a good job of kind of communicating the meaning and the depth of this story from scripture. I encourage you to dive into this portion, man. It's it's an awesome it's an awesome awesome story of love, of romance, of death, of war, of of reconciliation and, and just amazing things that are transpiring here in Second Samuel and in, in the last part of First Samuel. So dive in. Learn about this man David and uh, the things that he's doing. And more importantly than that, again look at it and ask the question Okay, this is a really cool historical story, mm. but what does it mean to me? Because there's meaning buried in every single aspect of Scripture that so can be applied today. So don't don't miss out on that piece. Okay. Hey, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you for following us. 
and uh, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time on The Pursuit. Thank you.